Today, we're going to be talking about a brand new construction townhome with low HOAs for under 200K that will deliver an over 7% estimated return on investment, not including appreciation, of course. It's brand new construction, as we uh, previously said, and under 200K, man, that is rare for 2021 Jacksonville new construction. got a few messages that some of our residents sent here. And, uh, you know, I think for most people here, we think about the numbers of the turnkey investment and we lose sight of the fact that nothing great happens for your turnkey rental property, unless you have a resident who loves living in your home and that they're there for a very long time. And you've got to treat your residents like gold. So check out this message. This is from Kristen Williams, brand new resident at 2824 Fleming street here in Jacksonville. And she left a five-star review and a message. And she said, I love them. They helped me and my son with our new place. And we love it. The whole team is awesome. Thank you guys. And it's a big shout out to our property management team, specifically Jessica, Caitlin, and Tia for making the move-in experience awesome for this resident, Kristen, here on Fleming Street. Um, we've got a couple other ones. I'm going to share more and more of these as we continue to go here. Here's one for Ashley Johnson, who's a property manager on our team. They specifically mentioned her. And this is from Kevin, who's a brand new resident. He said, Good experience, good staff, very helpful, very responsive. I've had no issues. My house is very nice. I get compliments all the time. So it's just really cool. I know as, a, as an owner myself, and I hear this from other clients as well, it's like, you know, the numbers, the cash flow, the return on the investment matters, of course. But when you know that the resident who is living in your home, feels really good about their situation and that they're treated really well and that they want to stay there for a long time, it's kind of like the icing on the cake for the investment, right? We want to do well for ourselves. We want to do well for ourselves by doing well for others. And it's an example of that. And just big ups to the team here. We've just crushed it on a couple of these um, examples here. And so I'm going to do a little bit more of that here in the group and on the show. So I love it. Spread man. the love. I love it. I love the icing on the cake. And every cake needs a party. And that party is us live today on the Not Your Average Investor Show, the JWB Rental Income Property of the Week. Wait, wait, wait. I am your host, Pablo Gonzalez. With me, as always, the man that I like to call GC because of his genius cash flow, because his genius concepts, because he generates cash flows, because he's a great co host. I say that sincerely. And also, I sincerely say your name is Greg Cohen. Say hello, Greg. Hello, everybody. Great to be with you. It's great to be with you all today because today, if you are looking, to acquire and own and invest in rental income properties, you're in the right place. If you're looking to know about the best in-class property management experience that you can possibly have in Jacksonville, you're in the right place. And if you're a real estate professional that just wants an edge on the Jacksonville market and is looking for great opportunities for you and your clients, you're in the right place. The next place to go is chatwithjwb.com. Hop on a call with the team. They'll, they'll take you from there. And are you ready for the Thursday roll call, Greg? Let's do it. We got John Hannon. Good afternoon, John. We got Andrew Barnhill is back. Good afternoon, Andrew. Nadim, hi, everyone. Good to see you. Alejandro Lopez. That guy could be my cousin, right? Pablo Gonzalez, Alejandro Lopez. Good good, really? to, good to see you, Alejandro. Who else we got? We got Carl Thompson. Good morning, everybody. All the way from the Centennial State. Do you know what the Centennial State is, Greg? Oh, no, I don't. I figured you wouldn't because I don't either. But <laughs> Carl, maybe you could tell us. I think it's Washington or Oregon, I would say. It's got to be West go Coast. Washington. Yeah, yeah, but I didn't want to sound like an idiot. <laughs> Well, good thing you almost didn't. <laughs> Welcome, Peter N. from New Jersey. Lou Carlson from the beautiful Summers, Connecticut. Who else we got in the house? Let me let me scroll down this chat right here. Oh man, we got, we got Eddie from Hot Atlanta. And we Eddie Eddie has not checked in today. Oh, but you I'm know, gonna have to get on Eddie. But here. you know who has checked in? Me and Alejandro's friend Bill Shields with his Buenos Tardes, mis hermanos y hermanas. Good to have you, Bill Shields. It's not a Thursday, but Bill's in the house. Hola. <laughs> Greg Stone is in the house. Good to see you, Greg. It's Colorado is the centennial state. Oh, man, I had no way off. Are you <laughs> that John Denver guy, huh? What does he know? All right, where where are we today, Greg? What is what is going on, man? All right, so today we're going to be talking about a brand new construction townhome with low HOAs for under 200K that will deliver an over 7% estimated return on investment, not including appreciation, of course. It's brand new construction, as we uh, previously said, and under 200K, man, that is rare for 2021 Jacksonville new construction. So we are gonna go to 6871 Lake Mist Lane in Jacksonville, Florida. 
3210. You ready to be magically whisked away here as Let's I fiddle rock. with technology? Oh, I always forget this, Greg. I'm sorry. I'm not the genius co-host. I'm just the, the fiddling. Very you average. You need to make sure they know how to fiddle. We need to, we want you to fiddle with us. <laughs> and the way that you're going to download this sheet that we are, we, the sheet that I'm going to be fiddling with today, it can be found at jwbinventory.com along with other properties that we go over on the Thursday edition, JWB Income Property of the Week. Wait, 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 wait. And uh, this is totally interactive, right? This is an interactive show for everybody. So we want you downloading the sheet, follow along at home. You can mess with all the numbers. You can fiddle all you want. And you can also talk to us here in the chat. You can talk to everybody else in the chat. As soon as you do that, oh, we got Samantha Lupo Lebaskoff from Dallas, Texas. That was a tough one. Raja Bantu's in the house as well. Welcome back. Welcome back, uh, Raja. And the trick to the chat, and everybody's got it pretty dialed in, is that normally when you opt into the chat, you're only chatting to GC and me. By the way, Andrew Barnhill is representing Hotlanta today. We forgot. That's awesome. Andrew's holding down the Hotlanta. There we go. So you're only chatting with us if you just do the default. You got to click on the all panelists button right above where you type and put all panelists and attendees so everybody else can see your wonderful collaborations. You can make a new friend, be part of the wisdom of the group. And if you got a question where... Raja already has one, actually. Fantastic. You pop open the Q&A. That's going to populate right here. That'll keep my attention. The chat moves quickly. So I may or may not go cross-eyed. I may or may not lose it. And we want you collaborating. So go to jwbinventory.com right now. Download that thing. And I'm going to get into Raja's question because this is well, a question-driven show. While we're doing that, let me just highlight one thing. We get a lot of questions from folks that are just reaching out to JWB saying, hey, I'd like to inventory. I'd like to see what inventory is available. I'd like to understand what type of assets are there. This this site, jwbinventory.com, is built exactly for you. If you have questions about inventory, every one of these properties of the week, we have there at JWB Inventory. So it's not just the one today that you're going to be able to fiddle with, like Pablo and I. You're going to be able to see every property of the week for, the, the, for every show that we've done. Um, you're going to get a great sense of the type of assets, inventory, price ranges, returns, and whatnot. So you want to make sure that you go there each and every week. And of course, do that right now on the show because it's just going to improve your experience. So. All right, sweet. So while we are talking about it, Raja Baldu says, interview with Gary was great, right? We had Gary Norcross, CEO of a Fortune 500 company on Tuesday. Yeah. He's the CEO of FIS, local fintech company here in town, Fortune 500. Any plans to bring CEOs from other Jacksonville companies? Raja, great question. And the answer is absolutely yes. We have really just loved this platform that we have with the show. And we've been able to attract really some top talent here. We've had a former mayor here, Mayor John Payton, who was here before. And we had Gary Chartran, who is a major philanthropist and just very, very into the education system here in Jacksonville. We had Lori Boyer, who is the CEO of the Downtown Investment Authority. And, you know, Gary, again, the CEO of FIS, a you know, do you remember the, the, the amount of money that Gary's company touches? It was it was in the trillions. It had a T in it, right? I thought it was really interesting. He said, so they, they, it's FIS. They basically are payment process. Everything that has to do with payment processing basically runs through FIS in the world. $14 billion of revenue in mm -hmm. his company on an annual basis. Sounds small. Sounds small. $10 trillion of payments passed through the processing. Insane. And what was really interesting that when he was talking about the breadth of his company, when we asked him about it, he was comparing the amount of activity that his company has a part in to the GDP of the country. Mm, <laughs> like mm. 10 trillion. He's like, this is a percentage of the GDP. For you to be a percentage of the GDP for what your company passes through the, the walls of your company, right? That's, that's, that's a big deal. So yes, thank you so much for the question. And we're continuing to try to attract the top talent here locally, business leaders, those that are really influential, because this is a platform for you if you're not in Jacksonville, for you to be in the know of what is going on here locally with the economics, with the business community, with real estate, of course, um, this can be that platform for you. There you go. And I also want to welcome Marilyn Cotterman from Homosassa, Florida. She's in the house. Home of the manatees. We also got Stevie B in the house. Welcome, Stevie B. And we got Chris from the Hudson Valley. Chris, that's a new name. Hope that you join us here going forward. We love building up this Not Your Average Investor Show community. And we got one more question. Raja says... Because we talked about this neighborhood where the FIS headquarters was going in as this place that seven years ago took a lot of vision to really want to drop that kind of coin into mm -hmm. that neighborhood. JWB made some bets in that neighborhood around that mm -hmm. time as well. It's called Brooklyn. It's here in Jacksonville. So it's not Brooklyn, New York. But he asks, do you have, any, any, do you have new investment properties in the Brooklyn area for sale? 
Great question. We do not. So it's interesting with Brooklyn, this, the area was certainly, you would call it, it was low income by any definition, call it five years ago, seven years ago. And we started to buy properties in that area, sometimes vacant land sometimes. And, and we, we really didn't know where that neighborhood was going to go, but we expected it to get better quickly. As it turns out, when you have a building that FIS is building right now, it's a $150, $200 million building, 12 story building. You have so many other commercial tenants that have come in hotels, restaurants, one of the nicest YMCAs in the entire country is right there. Yeah. It's become this, this commercially driven area. It's very walkable. I mean, it's, it's really wonderful. It, the land that we purchased in Brooklyn, we actually sold to commercial developers and it kind of bypassed it. It got better so quickly that it went from below income or low income type of neighborhood to below income. It didn't really go to below income where the numbers would work for JWB. It went really straight to commercial development, what multifamily developer is on there or what commercial developer is on there. It, it went very quickly. So a really big success story, not specifically going to help all of us collectively as far as acquiring new rental properties, mm -hmm. uh, turnkey rental properties, but bets like that, that need to be made by a vertically integrated provider like JWB are, that's what we need to do to make sure that we can secure inventory down the road. So we have a number of bets in other neighborhoods, just like this. Some will turn into turnkey inventory for JWB clients down the road. Some will be overwhelming successes like this turns into selling it to a commercial in a commercial interest. Guess what? Some of them won't work out. And some of them JWB will, will be sitting on for quite a while. <laughs> this, this has happened to be the, that one that went, got better quicker. Yeah, that just allows you to make other long-term bets, right? Because it goes straight to the balance sheet. It makes uh, it makes everything easier, right? Absolutely. Love it. All right, now we're going to make another bet here. We're going to whisk us magically away to 6871. Let me see if this is working. 6871, Mist Lane, Jacksonville, Florida, 32210. And we got a great question here in the Q&A. Nadim asks, not everybody has Office on their computer. Any suggestions for anybody that wants to fiddle with the sheet? I do, Nadim, because I don't have Office on my home computer. And until I came here, what I would do is I would open up Google Sheets and you could drop this thing into Google Sheets and open it there. And then it becomes interactive and that's a free program. So you can download the sheet to your computer, then you pop it into Google Sheets and it works. So that should help you. That should help you fiddle along with us here today. And today we also have Jen Filson in the house. Welcome back, Jen Filson. She's actually in town right now. She is. Visiting. So, all right, Greg, let's do the usual here, right? We're looking at this beautiful $180,000 two-story townhome. Mm -hmm. It's three bedrooms, two bathrooms. I don't need to even look back here. Look at this. I got this. I got this sheet over here. You got me Set all ready. Up for success, bro. Man, what am I doing? I'm like a rookie out here. Three bedroom, two and a half bathroom, a one car garage parking. It's leased for two years at $1,300. And let's talk about the thing that we come to on this show, right? We come here for the cash flow, the estimated conventional financing total monthly cash flow of $116 and the estimated conventional financing total ROI of 7.19%. GC, you know what I'm about to ask you? I do. All right. Explain to us what the total monthly cash flow number represents. So if you're new to the show, the first thing you need to be looking at when you're thinking about investing in a rental property is, is this asset going to pay for itself every single month? Right? Because if you're investing in rental properties, you have a decision whether to invest in an asset or a liability. Mm. And the simplest definition of an asset and a liability is, does it pay for itself every single month? Maybe pay you a little bit more in terms of positive cash flow, or does it cost you money every single month, right? A rental property where you have positive cash flow is an asset, right? If you're buying a rental property and the rents aren't enough to justify the purchase price and all the other expenses, then every single month you might go negative. Now, don't if you're if you're talking about assets and liabilities, whether that's an asset or liability, let's not get hung up on that. But at the fact, at the end of the day, you want to have a rental property that pays you every single month versus a rental property that causes you to go in the hole every single month. If you buy, if you buy a rental property that causes you to go in the hole every single month, you are speculating on home price appreciation because in an environment where prices go down or don't appreciate. If you are holding an asset that every single month you have to pay a couple hundred bucks, you're not going to really like that asset. And guess what? 
if you're trying to make this scalable, if you're trying to accomplish a certain passive income goal, and it dictates that you have to have three properties or five properties or 10 properties, and you buy those assets going a couple hundred bucks in the hole every single month, you're really not going to like those assets after a while. So if you're buying a rental property, the first and most important thing is to focus on does it pay for itself? Is it an asset? Does it bring me money every single month? And when you look here at this townhome here, estimated monthly cash flow is $116. That means on a typical month, this asset is going to bring in rental income. It's going to pay for all of the expenses, including debt on there, including the debt service. And after that, you're going to be left with a nice cushion afterwards, right? Over $100 of positive cash flow. $100 is not going to change your life when it comes to positive cash flow. That's not the reason to invest here. That's risk mitigation. That is what is important in making sure that it pays for itself there. So that's kind of high level. Specifically, the way that you get to this $116 number is you're going to take the gross rental income and you're going to subtract out your principal, interest, taxes, and insurance payments, as well as your property management fees. Those things happen every single month when your home is rented. And so this is representative of what a typical month is. The vast majority of your months will be just like that. And on those typical months, you'll have roughly $116 left over, which is risk mitigation and helps you become scalable. Really well, really well answered, man. I, I, I like the, for those of you that have not been with us uh, throughout this whole thing, the, the language of the scalability of the investment is something that you've added. I, I think it makes a lot of sense, right? The idea that kind of like Tim Hicks said a while back, Worst case scenario, somebody's paying down your debt. Somebody's paying down your mortgage and you're gaining equity from that. That's where you need to get to for positive cash flow. And then on top of that, it's a little bit of, little, little bit of cash in the pocket when it's conventionally financed. You've also taught me that it's now conventionally financed, but at some point that mortgage is going to get paid off. Absolutely. And at some point that cash flow is going to be much more and you reverse engineer when you're building out those plans. So exactly. yes, that $116 isn't going to change your life right now. But if you, you're in this for the long haul, you're in this for a full market cycle, that $116 is going to go up in time as mm -hmm. well, right? Absolutely. Through tenant pay, principal pay down, your resident paying your rent down for you, as well as home price appreciation. That, the, the other profit centers are really, really important here to actually building wealth through rental property investing. Cash flow is important. It's the first thing to look at, but it's not the end all be all. It's not going to change your life if all you're thinking about is buying for cash flow. Yeah, there you go. So it is it is the entry barrier, right? Like I like to I like to describe it as the quarterback arm strength in the, in the NFL for those football nerds that we kind of have in this chat cuz we're going to start talking football in, in a second. But all right, so Greg, so then tell me, so we got that cash flow, that is the average month. That right. is your typical experience, maybe 11 out of 12 months a year, mm -hmm. maybe 23 out of 24 months, you know, like sure. however you want to call it. What is the total ROI number represent? Talk to us about that. So if cash flow was the first thing to pay attention to, your total ROI is actually how you need to make decisions on rental properties. This is the entire picture you're looking at for all of the profit centers. If we're looking at cash flow, cash flow is just one of the five profit centers. It's slightly myopic. So it's important for risk mitigation, but once you accomplish that, threshold, you quickly need to look bigger picture. And that's where you need to incorporate these other profit centers. And the 7.19% total return on investment incorporates those other profit centers. What it does is it incorporates those other profit centers. It also incorporates the other expenses that you do see in rental properties that just don't happen every single month. So we're taking the extra good things that are happening. We're also taking the extra bad things that are happening. And we're making sure that we have an apples to apples comparison of how our money is performing. So specifically to get to that 7% number, let's start with the good things that we're taking into account, right? We already talked about positive cash flow as being one of the profit centers. Another profit center is your estimated tax savings. This is huge, right? This is money that you're earning and you don't have to pay taxes on right now because of these incredible tax savings and these tax advantages that everybody on the show is able to benefit from as long as you're investing in rental properties. You don't get these same tax savings if you're investing in the stock market and whatnot. So you get tax savings. That's another profit center for you. Principal pay down, like we just referenced, is huge. Every single month when your resident is paying that rent to you and your mortgage payment is being paid by that rent, a part of your mortgage payment is the principal amount that you owe back on your loan. And so 
when that it continues to get paid month and month and month and month and month, month after month, that's how you wind up in five years, 10 years, 20 years, looking back at your loan balance. And what was a $150,000 loan balance might be 50, might be zero, right? Your resident has paid this down for you. Super, super important in another profit center. So we're taking those into it. We are also taking the expenses into account, which are maintenance and vacancy costs, right? Those things do happen. They don't happen on a monthly basis, but over time we have data to show what your expected maintenance and vacancy costs should be over the long haul. And so we're taking those numbers into account. And then we're also taking into account uh, tenant placement fees. This is something that every property management company that you work with is going to charge when they put a resident in your home. So you better factor that into your returns and newsflash, most turnkey rental companies don't, but we, we of course do. So you take all of those good things and uh, you divide that by your initial investment, which is your down payment plus your closing costs. And here you're able to generate over a 7% return, which is really good for the Jacksonville market right now. We are trying to be able to preserve 7% estimated returns on investment as much as we can, knowing that prices are going up and interest rates are going up. And, and that's, that's where we are for that. Love it. So that is the holistic picture of the total return on investment with four of the five profit centers, right? We have not talked about property appreciation, which we will, but we got some questions that I want to get into here on the chat. Perfect. And I'm also getting triple dog dare to sing in the chat. I saw you smirking over that. I figured something was going on in the chat. I had no idea. I can't see everything that's going on on my screen right here. So let 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 the uh, let's let's let you shine, bro. Well, well, what's going on? I'm not a singer, but I do like to perform. And, uh, what happens every week is I pop open this this uh, property evaluation, and it starts fuzzy, and then I gotta like fiddle with it to get it to to be clear. And the D made a reference to a song that I really really like. I think it's by Inner Circle from back in the day. Okay, a reggae song, and he put in a. I can see clearly now the fuzziness is gone. <laughs> I love this. And then they followed up with, I can see how rental properties can help me. There you go. So I just, I just went for it there. All right. Now let's get, let's get a question. Well done, brother. Well Thank done. You. Thank you. Well Thank done. You. <laughs> All right. So Bill Shields asked, is this multifamily? I don't even know where to go. <laughs> I mean, um, is this multifamily? Interesting question. So townhomes, by definition, are single family. Multifamily are your duplexes, triplexes, quads, and whatnot. So a townhome is actually known as single family, single family real estate there. So this is single family. However, right, this is single family attached. And so many folks ask questions about, do you have multifamily properties at JWB in Jacksonville? And my answer is, well, you don't probably you probably don't want multifamily in Jacksonville to be quite honest because the vast majority of multifamily is in those neighborhoods that are not up to the JWB standard they are in low income neighborhoods it's just the way the housing stock here is in Jacksonville it's largely single family homes that were in neighborhoods that were established in the 50s 60s that's just pretty much how it is so if you go in search of multifamily in Jacksonville specifically you're probably going to go to those lower income neighborhoods which is not your best risk adjusted return on investment. Townhomes as a single family asset, are these are townhomes that we've built new construction. We can be in our neighborhoods and, and build these single family townhomes, which have so many of the same qualities and characteristics and benefits of multifamily. So you get the benefits of multifamily. You actually get some other benefits that you don't get in multifamily. I'm sure we'll get into that in just a minute here, but nobody really thinks about townhomes. Nobody thinks about, hey, should I, everybody goes, well, should I have multifamily? Should I get quads? You should really consider townhomes. You should really look at comparing multifamily and single family. And many people, when you actually do a deep dive on it, you're going to look at it and say, wow, a single family townhome has a lot of the same advantages and probably some more. There's a couple of disadvantages, which we'll go over as well, but it's clearly something to be considered if you're in the market for multifamily specifically. There you go. All right. Shuki Graziani, he's got a question. Good afternoon. Welcome back, Shuki, by yeah. the way. Good afternoon from Fort Lauderdale. Good afternoon, South Florida in the house. What is the optimum own to rent ratio for a residential rent? Looking at the 32210 zip code, 52% own versus 48% rent. You know, I don't know what, what the actual percentage, I don't, I don't have an optimal number based on data. You guys know most of the numbers that I put out in front of you are going to be based on, on data here. I'm going off of feel, right? Most of our neighborhoods are 50 to 60% rentals. So 40 to 50% owners, 
right? You want to be in a neighborhood that has significant rental demand because significant rental demand is going to keep your rent prices high, right? And it's also going to make it easy to fill your homes, right? It's one of the reasons why we don't want to go to the nicest neighborhoods in a market and start to buy rental properties because the rents don't keep up with the prices because there's not significant demand, right? And, you know, your rental demand in the nicest neighborhood in Jacksonville might be 5%, right? Right. So the rent demand is not there. The price doesn't go as high. And also filling that home for a rental in, in the beaches area of Jacksonville or wherever we are, the nicer, nicer neighborhoods, you know, you're, you're working with a much smaller pool. So, you know, this is just based on my feeling experience doing this for 15 years, 50 to 60% is kind of generally where our neighborhoods are. And you'll, you'll typically see that. There you go. jokey has got another question. What features tile versus carpet, granite, et cetera, are included in this property? You know? Yeah. So we build our single family townhomes, like we build our single family, you know, detached housing, which is your normal single family home that we would talk about. Everything we do is to make sure that we limit maintenance and vacancy cost, right? We go into this, not with the pie in the sky, hope that your resident is not going to, we don't hope that your resident is always going to treat this home like you would, or like I would, or like you would. We don't hope that we go into this knowing that your resident is going to be there for four and a half years on average, and they are not going to treat it like you and me. We build our homes to make sure that we can maintain, withstand though that type of a scenario and keep your maintenance costs low. So one of the things that we do is we have a hard surface in the living area, right? We do that because that way, if you had carpet there, it would be less money for JWB to renovate that home or build that home day one. We would actually make more money when we sold it. But we know that long-term, every year or every two years, you're going to need to rip that carpet up. And that's going to be a $1,200, $1,500 expense to you. We put granite countertops in our new constructions, in the kitchens. Right? That's not something that we need to do, but it's, a, it's an added cost and it reduces maintenance costs for our owners long-term. So all these things come with new construction with us, again, because the biggest pain point for you as an owner of rental properties is going to be maintenance costs and vacancy costs. If we can do a great job of bringing you on and then just simply keeping your maintenance and vacancy costs low, you are going to be a really happy client for a long time. You're gonna come back, or you're gonna fulfill the buying plan that we built with you. You're gonna add three, five, 10 properties and you're gonna invite your friends and your family to come and join JWB as well. So that's how important it is. And that's just real. You have to go into this knowing that your resident is not going to treat it like you. You need to build your rental properties or renovate them, however you're doing it, to withstand that and to make sure that the, rent, the, the expenses are low. I love the perspective, man, because as a real estate investor, you need to think a certain way. And real estate has this very emotional thing where everybody has an opinion on different things, right? Like I know that somebody, if they're seeing it as their own home, they're going to want granite countertops or certain things. Me as a green building expert, I'm kind of against carpet because I know it's bad for indoor air quality and it gets gross and, and, and things of that type of stuff. But the, the filter needs to be maintenance, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And maintenance, not by you, but by somebody living in there that is not you and doesn't care as much. Mm -hmm. And you only get that filter by getting the opinion of somebody that A, owns rental properties, B, manages a major property management company so that you are out there understanding these costs. And C, has this data flywheel that understands exactly how to quantify these costs. I just wanted to point that out. And add one more thing that is incentivized to keep those costs low, mm. right? Jade, like at the end of the day, our owners are on the hook for maintenance items that come their way, right? If, you know, our maintenance expectation on this home is 4%, rent 4% of the gross rents are going to be lost to maintenance each year on average. If that number is 8%, that is not a cost that comes to JWB immediately, right? But if I don't perform, if that cost comes in double what I told my clients to expect, they're not going to come back and they're not going to buy more properties yep. from JWB. And our business is that we keep the lights on by selling houses, right? So we have a huge incentive to make sure that we keep those costs down. And that's another differentiation between a lot of property management companies. One of the questions that you need to ask if you're vetting out a property management company is, how do you make more money when I make more money? 
with any financial person that's, you know, playing, you know, that that's taking care of your money, you should be asking that question. Nobody asks it for property management companies, right? But the biggest thing that they can do is to make sure that your costs are low, your maintenance costs and your vacancy costs are low. When you ask that question of how do you make more money as a property management company, when I make more money as a rental owner, there's usually not a really good answer because they don't have houses to sell, right? They have property management services and roughly a, a quarter to a half of their income comes from tenant placement fees. Mm -hmm. So it, they get stumped. You need to have a really good answer if you're going to build a rental property portfolio that your, your property manager is so critical. You need to make sure that they make more money when you make more money. Love it, man. And, I, and it sounds to me like a great thing to ask my portfolio manager for my 401k. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> bad, prepared. You, know. you might not like the answer. You're going to get disappointed. All yeah. right. Somebody who never disappoints always shows up to the show. Anon from France. Anonymous Attende asked the question, is this new construction? I feel like you've answered it, but I wanted to ask Yes, you. this is new construction. In fact, what I'm showing you here is another townhome. As you can see, the, the print there underneath the picture of property is currently under construction. The photo ab above is a different property with the same floor plan. We have already built out this Lake Mist neighborhood. There are other townhomes in this neighborhood that we have already built out over the past few years. And we're continuing to do the same thing that we've had success with in the past. We've built those out. We've rented those homes. We've sold those assets to our clients who now have them as passive income streams. And then we just build out the next. So the photo here is of a previous building. It is the exact same floor plan, the exact same model, just so you guys can get a visual. And this home will be done in the next three to four months, just like all of our new construction is now. You put it under contract, lock it in. The purchase price is set with you. It doesn't go up, even though prices have been going up. And then, you know, and then you close in three to four months. There you go. And I think it was uh, Andrew Barnhill that put it in the chat that he just put one in contract, just like it, same floor plan that he's, uh, he's reinvesting. Congratulations, in Andrew. Yeah, that's right. That's right. He announced his, uh, his closing on his newest one when you weren't here. When oh, you're, gotcha. You're out golfing with your friends. Yeah. I got to say, I was listening to the show with Jen. Yeah. And was, it, was it on that show? I'm not sure if it was a Jen show or the oh. one on Tuesday, but yeah, well, I, I missed some really good shows, guys. Yeah. You guys <laughs> crushed it. So yeah, I appreciate did. everybody. Yeah, you did. We got you running laps. All right. Her Francois asked, this property has an HOA fee, which is surprising given I haven't seen a lot of JWB homes in an area where an HOV fee, HOA fee needs to be paid. Is this going to be more of the norm going forward for JWB homes? I love this question. There's a lot that I want to unpack with this HOA conversation. And the question is, is this going to be the norm? So let, let me make sure I kind of get to that one here. Let's talk about the positives and the negatives of HOAs and the positives and negatives of townhomes, really. And HOAs is a part of that, right? The reason why most clients love new construction townhomes is number one is the purchase price, right? For your purchase prices for normal, what I'm going to say, single family detached housing, it's typically between 200 to 275, right? The median home sales price in Jacksonville right now is about 280, 285. So you're below middle income there, but you're still 200 to 275. That's for a detached house. People love new construction townhomes because you can get in at a lower purchase price, right? The purchase price here is 180,000. So for those who are on a more constricted budget, it might be a great opportunity for you. If you're an investor and you're rapidly trying to get to a diversified portfolio, which we know is three properties, we want you to get there as quickly as possible. Well, buying a lower priced asset gives you more firepower to get to three properties quicker. So Number one, especially in an environment where prices are going up quickly, that is the number one attract, most attractive thing. What you'll notice here is for this $180,000 purchase price, your lease amount here is $1,300. If you were to compare another single family home, you wouldn't see that rent to price ratio, another single family detached home. Let me, let me make sure I specify that. You wouldn't see such a high rent to price ratio, right? So for like a $1,300, rent, it'd be 190 or 195 or maybe 200,000 for that purchase price for a single family detached. So for townhomes, your rent to price ratio is better, which is great. We love that. That means more cash flow. And in a vacuum, that means more cash flow, sure. right? Your property taxes are going to be slightly lower because your purchase prices are lower. Your homeowner's insurance costs are still low, just like any other new construction, right? Homeowner's insurance here, $511 a year. 
great, right? Brand new construction, that is, is a huge asset. Now, that's all the positives of, of a townhome. Let me actually, let me say one more bit, a couple more big things about positives for townhomes. Neighborhood, like we talked about, matters. And then financing. Financing for a new construction townhome is actually much easier than multifamily. In multifamily, specifically in Jacksonville, there aren't a lot of comparable sales in the neighborhoods. So if you were to buy a multifamily property in a neighborhood, in one of our core neighborhoods in Jacksonville, you're going to make it pretty tough on the appraiser to have other comps to choose from to be able to justify the appraised value. You just make their job a lot harder. So you have a lot more appraisal misses, and that's not fun for anybody. Something else, too, on the financing side for townhomes that's a positive compared to multifamily is your flexibility, right? A lot of people say, well, I want to buy a quad. I want to buy a four unit quadruplex. Well, you have the same opportunity to buy a four, four units in a townhome building. It's the, it's the same thing, right? It's under one roof, right? You get the same economies of scale that you love. And, and you know, you get the same, you know, people say, well, I want to get a quad because if one resident leaves, I've still got three that are paying. Same thing with the townhome. If you got four units under one roof in a townhome, one leaves, you still got three that are paying. Same thing. But flexibility of financing and sale really matters. When you buy four townhomes, each of those is an individual loan. So let's think about this later on. Like, let's think that you own these four townhomes that are each an individual loan later on. If you wanted to sell two of those for some reason, you could sell two and keep two. If it's 10 years down the road and you got some great appreciation in the, in the mix and you wanted to refinance two of those, you could refinance two of them. You can keep the other ones the same. Right? If you're in a quadruplex, you don't have that flexibility. You can't break up and only sell two of the units in a quad. You can't you know, only refinance two of the units in a quad. It's all or nothing. So you have a lot of flexibility there. So all very positive things. Shall I go to the negatives or did you have any, anything to add there? Well, we have Stevie B is asking about the differences of townhomes and multifamily, but Herve had asked, are there going to be more HOAs in more properties that JWB is offering? So maybe you can answer that question and then I, we I've can- I've made him wait patiently. <laughs> you made him wait. <laughs> Herve, you've been waiting patiently, buddy. You deserve to be answered. Let's talk specifically townhomes. Townhomes are a relatively small percentage of what we build, right? I don't know what the number of the percentage is, but call it 10, 20% of our overall housing stock townhomes over the years, right? We bought this land sometimes five, 10 years ago, and we build out buildings as we see fit. We don't want to oversaturate the market. Have, we don't want to put 100 townhome units available at one time. So slowly but surely, we build those, those, those out. So no, I don't see that you're going to see, you're not going to see an overwhelming number of townhomes like become what JWB does. Townhomes tend to have the highest HOA fees as well because that's a part of the townhome community, right? More of the services that they provide are under an HOA and that's just, that's just the way it goes. So for townhomes, you will generally see higher HOA fees, right? And for, for this, the HOA dues are $1,640 for the year, right? You're going to see higher HOA fees for townhomes, but the percentage of townhomes is not going to overwhelm the overall single family detached. It's just another opportunity for us to be able to add inventory that we've had over the years. I did want to point out one more thing though. Single family detached houses have HOAs as well, right? Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes, right? Depending on the area, the neighborhood, right? Sometimes, and then, but they're typically lower. There might be $400 a year or $600 a year. We have to make sure that the numbers work to make sure that we, when we take the HOAs into account that the numbers work and that we can mitigate the risk of HOA increases coming down the pike for, for owners. If you're thinking about a downside of townhomes and I'm taking JWB out of this, you're just thinking about investing for yourself, make sure if you do invest in a townhome that there is some specific influence that can mitigate the risk of your HOA fees skyrocketing. Because one thing that can happen is you can buy into an HOA, you can buy into a townhome community the leadership, the, the HOA and the board of directors might want to start putting pools in your HOA or putting gates in front of your HOA or huge playgrounds. And, and all that means to you is your HOA fees as a community are going to go way up. It's not what you want, right? That's not what we want here. And so one of the things that JW, JWB does to mitigate that risk is we have significant influence on the HOA. Sometimes we even serve on the board of directors for the HOA. 
uh, for this case, specifically on Lake Mist, our president, Alex Afakis, is on the board of directors, which is a huge mitigating risk. It's not always that way. Sometimes what we do is we actually build out the community and then we hire the HOA that is going to then you know, the, the, the managing member of the HOA, which runs the HOA. So those are some things that we do to make sure that this $1,640 HOA fee does not become 3000 next year. The other thing is that usually if you are in an HOA, excuse me, if you're in a townhome community and there is something that is presented that would raise the fees significantly, there's a vote, right? Every member, every property owner in there gets a vote. And then if the vote passes, then it, then it goes through. Well, Pablo, who do you think the property owners are in this Lake Miss community? Well, I would assume based on a little a data point here, I think it was, who is it? Somebody said in here that they own three of these in, in, in Lake Miss. I would assume it is mostly JWB investors. There it is, right? Well, JWB only sells turnkey property, right? This entire model of us selling this asset and doing the long-term property management is what we've been doing for 15 years, right? That's all we do. So as we've built out this community, the, the, and now there are some previous buildings before we built it out. So it's not 100% JWB clients, but call it 60% right now. It will be 70%. They're all JWB clients. And they, they come to us. They want us to advise them on how to vote. So another significant risk mitigation strategy when it comes to HOAs. And it's really, really important. You know, that is the number one way that you know, an, a rental property investment in a townhome could go sour if you, if you lose that sort of control. Yeah, that was Samantha that said that she owns three in, in, in here who's hanging Samantha. out. Samantha. Yeah, very cool, very cool. Okay, so Bill Shields and Alejandro Lopez, who clearly think alike, both asked, does the appreciation differ with townhomes versus single family homes? We have not seen the appreciation differ. Uh, and when, when we're talking about appreciation rates, I'm always thinking macro. I'm always thinking long-term. So just know that with my answers, right? I don't play into the game of like, what's appreciation going to be over the next one to five years because there's really not good data to support one way or another. And, you know, appreciation over the short run is really speculative. I think we've all seen that, right? But over the long haul, over a market cycle is what I have a lot of confidence in. There's a lot of data to support that real estate is cyclical. And if you look at what has happened in a real estate market over the last 30 years, you can use that as your baseline. And if you invest for the next market cycle, chances are that your home price appreciation rate is going to, to, to get very close to that or match that. We do not see differences in townhomes and single family over the long haul. So townhomes and single family detached over the long haul. All right, there you go. Tova Robinson, new name, Tova, good to have you. Welcome to the show. She asks, what was the down payment? So Tova, I'm going to go over here and I'm going to fiddle with the sheet right now. Non-recourse, nope, this one, financing. All right. I don't know if you can see this in the, in the, I'll zoom in right here. But for this one on the sheet, it is defaulted to 25% down payment. And that means a down payment amount of $45,000. And in the sheet, you will also see that your closing costs are also included in this, right? Because we include all the costs and everything that you need to see. And out here is the total calculation. But if you wanted to go to jwbinventory.com and fiddle with this yourself, you are free to put in 20% and see how it all changes, right? And Greg, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's either 20% or 25%, right? Yes. Well, technically you could put down more, but most people will put down 20% or 25% because that's your best risk adjusted return on investment. There you go. There you go. Sergio's coming in hot from Puerto Rico. Great show. Townhome town home was my first property. Sergio, I was in Puerto Rico last weekend. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Very cool, man. All right. Let me go back to this. All right. I won't do that yet. So Stevie B, he says, I hope that Greg returns to that line of conversation. I want to hear more about how he's comparing townhomes to multifamilies. I wonder if you meant owning multiple townhomes is like owning a multifamily. Yeah, Stevie B, that's exactly where I'm going with that conversation. Right. If you think about why people want to own multifamilies, many times it comes down to risk mitigation. They're thinking on the expenses side, right? You don't want to have four roofs that could fail. You'd rather have one roof that could fail that serves four units that are collecting income for you. Right. Same thing with other, other parts of, you know, expenses that could happen. Right. So the, that economies of scale conversation. Well, in a townhome community, right? You could buy four of these Lake Mist townhomes and you'd have the same exact thing. It's four units that are attached under one roof, 
right? So you've got that. It's the same exact thing. People also think about it, risk mitigation strategy, right? They're, they're saying, well, what happens if there's a vacancy? I feel really good about having the building's payments covered, even if one resident isn't there. I've got three that are paying in a multifamily, right? In a quadruplex. Well, same thing in a townhome. So you're, you're in the exact same spot. The, let's see here. I mean, I can, the financing is a big one that nobody talks about. I mean, that's the one that I try to shed the light, most light on, right? Financing for multifamily properties is very difficult for in a market like Jacksonville and in many markets across the country, right? It comes down to how really how easy, like your, your interest rates change a little bit when it's multifamily, but a lot of it comes down to, can you get your property to appraise? Because you don't, you can go into a loan to try to get a multifamily property and put 20% down. But if there's no comparable sales in that area, right? If there's, if there's very limited housing stock, People don't sell multifamily properties often. And if you're an appraiser and you ha- you're charged with coming up with a value, if you don't have data, you're just, it's, it's hard for you. And so many times an appraisal on a multifamily property comes in low. So then you, as the purchaser of that property are faced with it. Do you want to continue to buy that multifamily property and just bring the difference to closing? And then that might mean you, you might be bringing 40% down instead of 20% down, right? Do you want to make that decision to do that? How does that affect your return on investment? The numbers change significantly there. That's, that's a very big reality. That is one, I mean, at the end of the day, there's not a lot of housing stock in Jacksonville for multifamily properties in our core neighborhoods, and we're not willing to go to the low-income neighborhoods to do it. So that's the number one reason we don't have multifamily properties. But number two, financing challenges are rampant. Uh, for multifamilies. So while you are on that appraised value, it's kind of uh, perfect because Tayo Ladipo asks, can you talk about the differences in appraised values of newer townhomes versus say older rehabbed single family homes? Sure. Hard. You know, I, it's hard to generalize, right? A lot of your, so the way that you're going to determine values are, you know, in a small radius, what's sold and call it the last three months to maybe six months. So it's really location specific. So you'd really need to look at what other renovated homes were selling in this area, this town home. And so I, you know, I'll kind of ballpark it for you, right? Generally speaking, our renovations right now sell for about 180,000 or so, maybe 200,000 on the high end, you know, maybe a little bit less. So, and without me looking at data, you know, your $180,000 is where you're at for this single family town home. So you get some discount to in market value compared to what single family detached would be, right? Your normal home is going to sell for more. And that's just because at the end of the day, right? People would rather, if they can afford it, people would rather not live next to somebody, right? People would rather be detached, but there's a cost associated for that. Not everybody can afford that. So if somebody wants to be in this location to have brand new construction and their budget allows to to buy it for 180,000, this is an unbelievable option compared to a renovated home, which is detached, but is not brand new. So there's a, there's a balance there. So long way of answering your question without really perfect data to look at, it's probably going to be similar just in this neighborhood. It's not always going to be exactly the same because neighborhoods will, will differ. So don't always take that as being, being the way it is. And you will get a, your, your purchase price will be at a discount to what that single family detached house would sell for simply because people perceive more value in being detached than attached, but it's close. Got it. So all else equal, townhomes should be less expensive than a single family detached home, but then it varies based on location. It varies based on new construction, old construction, based on state, you know, status of the actual home and, and whatnot. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But I would just qualify, right? New construction townhome mm-hmm. should be at a discount to what new construction detached exactly. would be. Yeah. Exactly. So you got to isolate every variable. Mm-hmm. And if you keep all the variables the same, then townhome less than yes. new construction. Exactly. <laughs> right. Because but, that's how you or me or anybody generally tends to think we would rather be detached than, than attached. Yeah. All right. Stevie B's got a question. Will JWB build these in their traditional communities and or will they build these closer to the city center? And he says, doesn't know... If- that makes sense because he's never been to Jax. He's like one of the many investors that just 
by sight unseen here because they just trust you, Greg. Well, I, I appreciate that, Stevie. And I know I know you do your due diligence too. I know you know that the numbers work and you pay attention to the things that matter. You don't have to come to Jacksonville. You don't have to be an expert in Jacksonville for this to work. So will we be doing this? So we do these in our core neighborhoods, meaning like the west side of Jacksonville is a core neighborhood of Jacksonville, the north side of Jacksonville, Arlington, and south side. But I want to make sure I specify, like there are specific townhome communities and townhome lots. So generally, we're not going into a typical single family detached neighborhood and building townhomes in that single family detached neighborhood. Typically, you can't do that without land variances. And then generally, you just, I don't know, it's not, it's not a typical thing. So the answer to your question is, we're going to stay in our, our core cash flow neighborhoods. We're not going to uh, stray from that, but these are specific townhome communities within the core neighborhood. There you go. All right, GC, we got two more questions and I want to talk about appreciation in a second, right? So let's do this one quickly. Dennis Yeager asks, are there different standards for tenants as far as qualifications to be in a townhome community? Or I should ask, does the board that oversees a community vet the tenants or does JWB handle that portion? No change. JWB vets that resident just like we would any other resident. No difference. Perfect. Stevie B asks, can you finance the purchase of multiple townhome townhomes at the same time? Easy answer there. Absolutely. Yes. It's one of the benefits of single family townhomes. All right. Now we're going to do that trick, Greg. We talk about the fact that JWB under promises and over delivers. So they always put 0% appreciation rate here in this evaluation. Why is that? We do that for two reasons. We this, this investment for you to be able to get income every single month, which is not something you get in the stock market and still for your asset to perform at a 7% rate, this asset stands on its own. This compares to any other asset out there. And we're not even talking about home price appreciation yet. So on its own two feet to be able to have that risk mitigation at 7%, that's the number one reason why we don't feel inclined to actually throw all of the appreciation numbers in there. And the number two reason is because in order to count on home price appreciation, you need to be in this game for the long haul. You need to be investing for a full market cycle. As I mentioned earlier, I don't really play into the game of what's home price appreciation going to be in the next one to five years, or I don't make decisions based off of it because that's highly speculative. I don't know. I don't know what the data is going to show. But what I know is if you're in this game for a full market cycle, which is known to be between 10 to 20 years, the history shows us that it's most likely going to repeat itself over the next market cycle, but you have to be in the game. The reason I don't put it on here right off the bat is because I don't know if you're going to be in the game for 10 to 20 years. When clients come on board, we ask them for their commitment to hold for at least five years. That doesn't mean they have to stick to that commitment. Could they actually sell the property sooner than that? Yes. I wouldn't advise it. We wouldn't advise it, but we want to make sure that the five-year plan is, is, is at least what you're committed to right off the bat. But five years is not long enough to count on home price appreciation as well. So I don't know how long your horizon is. We go conservative and we don't put any appreciation on our initial evaluation. Lastly, it's an under promise and over deliver moment. If you come in here and you're excited like I am to purchase an asset that produces 7% and it's risk mitigated, and then this happens to appreciate in the five-year window and the 10-year window and the 20-year window, like I say, you're going to be just ecstatic and that's where we want to be. There you go. So let's say we do hold it for a full market cycle, right? Right now, home price appreciation is somewhere around 10. Last, last year was like 20%. It was insane. But the full market cycle, as you've taught us, has, has been known to stay constant in a full market in in those periods that you talk about, including the Great Depre the Great Recession, right? Mm -hmm. And that has been known to be 4.3%. So if I'm somebody that's going to hold it 10 to 20 years, I can count on this 4.3%. We put it in the evaluation because you can fiddle with it, press enter, and shabam, it goes from 7% to 22.83%. Greg, explain that. The the secret sauce behind investing in rental properties. More than anything else about rental properties, the thing that I love is that you can get smart debt on it so readily available. Financing is what allows you to take leaps and bounds in creating wealth for yourself. Now you have to do it in a risk mitigated fashion, which is why I said cash flow is the first thing to look for. But when you look at an asset that can pay for itself, including the financing cost, and you can scale that up, you have this incredible wealth creation opportunity. When you take advantage of financing, what many, many people don't understand is that as your market value goes up, as the market value of the home appreciates, you get to capture the full market value, the full game. You and me and Pablo, I know with your two properties, they're financed. As the houses have appreciated over the last year, 
you and your family are capturing that. Yep. But you only put down a fraction of that initial investment. That's right. And the bank brought the difference. That's right. And when you're calculating your return on investment, you're calculating what's the gain that you've earned over how much did you put down? Not your purchase price. How much did you put down? And so simply here, if you're thinking about putting down 25% and your houses appreciate 4% a year, like it's been shown to appreciate in the Jacksonville market, you only put down 25%, your, your return on investment from appreciation is actually 16%. 16% just from home price appreciation. That's why I love debt, smart debt, and that's why I love holding for a full market cycle. Because when you compare that profit center, which jumps your return on investment over 20% here to the other asset classes, you just, it usually cannot compare on a risk mitigated asset that pays you every single month that long-term you have an asset that produces 20% plus on your money. Uh, you just don't get that elsewhere. And that's why I love it so much. Yeah, man. And you, you've taught me to love it in, in, in showing me this trick over and over and doing it here on the show. And I started a year and a half ago and I didn't know anything about this stuff. And, and, and that to me is the big, the big aha moment, right? Like this power of leverage, this idea that you're getting the appreciation. If I have a hundred thousand dollar property and I'm putting down 20%, the appreciation happens over the hundred thousand dollars, not just the 20, not just the 20,000 that I put down. And you also taught me that this is why for a long-term home, you know, hold investor, you want to look at a high growth market. And it's the reason why it's the secret sauce of the Jacksonville investment, right? Like Absolutely. it's not that like extra hundred bucks of cash flow I'm going to make every day. It's that compounding return on leverage that you continue to get because Jacksonville happens to be the highest growth average it is. appreciation in, in the US for cash flowing markets. For cash flowing markets out there. For those risk mitigated markets out there, you know, I know Cleveland, Cleveland's average home price appreciation rate over the last 30 years is 2.3%. The difference between 2.3% and 4.3% on a $200,000 asset over the next 30 years is equal to hundreds of thousands of dollars of additional return on investment. And so you're right, that's, that should be the difference maker for when you're just deciding between a market. Can it produce positive cash flow? Great, it's in the running. Now what's next? Does it also produce an above average rate of home price appreciation? It puts a smile on my face every time you take a shot at Cleveland, Greg. I like it. <laughs> you know, it's easy. I am from Pittsburgh. So, I mean, that's, that comes naturally. That's what you do. GC, another great show, buddy. I just want to iterate to everybody that, you know, if you're, if you're here for rental income properties, this was, this was a great, you know, great use of your time. I hope you, I hope you got something. If you're here to find out about property management, GC gave you some great notes here, mm -hmm. right? Like if you're a real estate investor or a, a, a real estate professional, with an edge on the market, you got a bunch of great nuggets that's going to lead to great opportunities. If you want to talk about those opportunities for you, go to chatwithjwb.com. And Tuesday, we got a returning guest. He's a crowd favorite, GC. When you're not here, he holds it down a lot. You know, my business partner, Alex, he's, uh, he is the star of the show everywhere he goes. And uh, it will be no, he will, he, will not, he will not disappoint. I guarantee you that. He kind of is. And we have this now ongoing segment of JWB Jacksonville real estate insider C because <laughs> Alex is somebody that's just a mover and shaker downtown. He's been spending the last 14 years really affecting the macro economy here in Jacksonville and the insights and the conversations that he gets to have the, that he's privy to the information that deals what's happening behind the scenes gives him a really, really unique perspective on what's happening. And because we got this platform, we get to share it with everybody. So he's a, and he's my best friend since forever. Right. So it's hard for me to, you know, completely give him compliments, but the guy, is just in the middle of so many cool things that are going on downtown. I was just going to share this with you. You know, we were talking about the landing. Mm -hmm. For those who aren't from Jacksonville or familiar with Jacksonville, the landing is was this iconic shopping downtown center that was here for 30 years. It was sort of, it's right on the water and it had fallen in disrepair and something needed to be done with it. The city uh, raised it, right? It's, it's now this amazing green space right on the water. And everybody's wondering, how are we going to make the best use of the landing? downtown. Well, just to show you, like Alex is so involved. He was selected as a subject matter expert for this RFP for which of the, of the new companies that are coming, going to come in and design that space. He was one of five subject matter experts. So he got to sit there as these new 
companies were coming in, sharing their vision. And, I've, and now it's publicly available, all mm -hmm. of their vision. And some heavy hitters too, man. It was like Gensler, Gensler and like, yeah. like all, all these like really, really big developer names with really big name de architecture design firms, right? Like I'm nerdy about that stuff. I get and it. The, the, it's so cool. Like the, the designs, I'll post it in the group for sure. But he's there and, and I'm talking to him about, it. he's like, I loved this one, but you know what? It needed this. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, what happens at that point, right? Because I've never been a subject matter expert on this. You know, I don't, I don't really know. And he's like, oh, well, you know what? I, I take my ideas and I submit them and it goes to the board. And then the companies all change their, you know, based on all the. And I'm like, you know, how cool is that? That he is getting to literally change the landing, right? So those are the types of discussion that he gets to be a part of. And that's why we want to bring him on the show. Because we want you guys to be able to have that access to that type of information. And then, you know, he's, he's the man. So. Don't, don't tell him I said that though. I love, there, there will also be a lot of the buddy comedy happening, right? If you like what happens here, the buddy comedy between Alex and Greg is phenomenal, right? Yeah. So listen, at the end of the day, you make the show happen. The, the not your average investor show family, it never falls on deaf ears here that you take an hour of your day on the middle of a Thursday, middle of a work day, hang out with us. It's a testament, hopefully to the value that you're getting. And we take that really, really seriously. So thank you for joining us. And GC, I'll give you last words, buddy. Thank you, everybody. This is, is so fun, especially when I am out for a week and I come back, I just realized how much I missed it. I missed <laughs> you guys. You guys are incredible. Just a quick note, Pablo and I will both be at the Yellowbird Connect That's right. event tonight. If you're local here in Jacksonville, it's one of the best networking, real estate networking groups there is. So we'll both be there tonight. Would love to come and connect. And especially for those real estate professionals who are here locally, there's a lot of ways that we can work together with you and JWB. We can help your clients. We can help grow your business. And of course, JWB. So would love to meet anybody that I haven't met personally yet at Yellowbird Connect tonight. All right. See you tonight or Tuesday for secrets.